morning. Our apostles and song service. Time to worship, reflect. Thank you for the worship team. You know, I've kind of in recent weeks gotten away from my my thanking people for what they do, and, and today I wanted to uh, kind of bring us back to that. I wanted to um, single out uh, Shelly Hunter, Lolo, um, because, you know, whenever there's a need for the two to four year old for the nursery, uh, hers is always, always the first name on there, and, and always on there. When we need somebody to watch the youth leaders' kids on Wednesday night, it seems like uh, every other week Shelly signed up to be over there taking care of those kids. And um, you know, when we asked for people to watch kids upstairs in the nursery on Sunday, Shelly was the first name on there. And uh, so I, I wanted to say thank you, Shelly, for your faithful service. It is greatly appreciated. Um, are you ready? <laughs> are we going to do it anyway? Okay. All right, uh, we're going to continue with our testify, and uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're going to have several people up, uh, although next week we won't because of the, the order of the service. So this week I've asked if Ron Becker would come and, and share his testimony with us. Bear with me, folks. <laughs> uh, I am totally out of my element here. That's probably why I flunked speech in high school. <laughs> uh, I'm Ron Becker. I was born and raised right here in this valley. Grew up in Lolo. Born in Hamilton. Uh, have two wonderful boys, Scott and Cody. And married Norma. 34 years ago today. <laughs> when Glenn asked me last week to do this, I figured this was a good time to do it, a date that I'll never forget <laughs> what happened today. Uh, I grew up in a Catholic home. My folks were true blue Catholics. Uh, went to church. Oh, most uh, 17 years, and then when we moved to southern Idaho, the Catholic Church was like 56 miles away, and we were pretty much, I didn't go to church after that until we got married, and then it was like, go to church to please Norma, and show, you know, try to be a good father for the boys. I was a good father, but I lacked in the going to church and the Lord, teaching the Lord. Thank God, Norma was there to take him under her wing and, and teach him. And Cody, to this day still, he goes to church, thank God, and he knows who the Lord is. But anyhow, uh, after we got married, I gave him up as Jesus, who was that? I gave myself to Jesus in 1994 at a Baptist church on the Highway Baptist in on 8 Mile. And uh, <coughs> shortly after I got saved, me and my folks were up in a, was one of the incidents that I know he's there. Uh, I got hit in the face by a log. And I went out like a light, and the next thing I knew, I felt like I was just floating. And there was this huge, brightest light I've ever seen. And then the next thing I know, I woke up, my mom was standing over me, and I go, whoa, what happened? You know, and then later on that, that day, that evening, I had half of my lens stuck in my cheekbone, right here, right before it went into the eye. And, uh, and I was telling my mother about this bright light, and I was going to go up. This wasn't your time to go in. And till this day, I still think if, if I wouldn't have been saved, it probably would have been my last day. But uh, that still didn't 
uh, convinced me to keep going to church. Uh, Fourteen years later, I met this man, John Cahoon, that I worked with in North Dakota. And he convinced me to get my driver's chauffeur's license and stuff and to work with him in North Dakota. And the company, well, I knew him, I worked for him here earlier in 09. And I knew he was a Christian. He'd been a Christian his whole life. He's one man that I that I know that never missed a day of worshiping in his life. And the Lord has always brought good men into my life. John, Kelly, Glenn, and my friend, real good friend. If you want to be here today, I told him to stay home. <laughs> Ken, you folks have prayed for Ken and his wife. They are a true testimony. They have both battled cancer and come out survivors. And now I know for sure that there is a Lord. And I feel I couldn't have done this a year ago or six months ago. Glenn, he, when he first said that he wanted everybody to give a testimony, I, first thing I said, oh Lord. <laughs> no, 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 no. But finally, the day had come. So, but I do. I do love the Lord, and I thank you for all the men that he has put in my life. And Glenn, thank you so much for being here, doing what you're doing. You know, and I remember when Kelly, the day that Kelly told everybody that they were planning to go to <clears throat> California, I thought, no, oh, you can't. You can't. You, you, know, you have to stay for for me. But and then I just asked the Lord, why why is he got to go? You know, we're just I'm just getting comfortable with Kelly. Well, a few days later, a couple weeks later, Glenn uh, did a sermon, and I thought he was awesome. And I still think that. Thank you, Glenn, for everything. Um, I, I'm just, I feel so comfortable anymore coming to church. And I know the good Lord is, he's still working on me. We have a long ways to go. But uh, I guess I think everybody has a long ways to go. Uh, thank you for being good people here. It made me feel really comfortable. Thank you. testimony to you guys that, you know, after years and years of being church, Ron actually looks forward to coming to church because of how you guys make him feel, you make him feel welcome. And I think that's an incredible testimony to the fellowship of Jesus Community Church. Thanks for your prayers all these years. Um, we are... How many of you brought your homework? <laughs> Joan did. Oh, we got three, four. Oh, here we got. Okay, we got four and a potential. <laughs> a while back, I had asked you to start reading through Scripture with an eye open for Scriptures that would indicate the Trinity. And it's been a long time coming, but there's a reason for that. And the reason is I didn't get to this point till today. <laughs> so, um, just out of curiosity, um, those of you that did, did the, the research, how many of you came up with 15 scriptures indicating scripture? At least 15. Okay. How many came up with at least 20? You cheated. You looked on the internet. <laughs> how many came up with 30? She's on the second page, so. <laughs> oh, 
so much. Yeah, many pages. <laughs> oh my, she's got a lot. Of them. <laughs> 57? About 80? Did anybody get more than 80? <laughs> really? Nobody got more than 80? Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I stopped at about 115. I stopped counting. Now, I knew. I, I did things a little different than you guys, though, probably, because I started looking at the original languages, because in the original languages, what we see in English isn't always in the original language. That's why we believe scripture to be inerrant in the original language, because of some of the ways that the English language works. Sometimes it leads to a little bit of dubious translation, because we're not really sure how that word fits, so we, we do our best to make it fit into our idiom so that we can understand it, okay? Uh, and one of the things that I looked up in, in the Hebrew were uh, any time that God was used in a plural form. Oh my, there were quite a few just in there. Then I started looking up uh, any references to what we believe to be the Trinity. Actually, first I looked up, uh, you know, how many would be in the Trinity. Now, I had, uh, I had the advantage because I knew this message was coming up, so I was doing research. And so my reading was in addition to the research. So I will we'll discount me in the quest for number one most uh, scriptures found. But at about 127, I think, is when I quit counting. Um, but then I started looking up how, okay, so we know there's a plurality. How do we know how many? Uh, oh, okay, well, there's, there's at least three. Uh, oh, okay, we see that there's no more than three. There's only ever indication of three. So then I started looking up for the three individual components. So I look up any reference to God that, that speaks specifically of the Father, any that speaks specifically of the Son, any that speaks specifically of the Holy Spirit, any that speaks specifically of the Savior. And then I start putting all these things together. And, and what I came up with is pages and pages and pages and pages of notes. And then I had to try and put them in order for you guys. We'll see how well that worked. Um, the first thing that I want to do, first I commend you, if you did the research, good. Um, quite honestly, if you guys as Christians are depending on me to do your study, you're in a world of hurt. Okay? Um, we want to be more like the Bereans that are doing the research on our own. Okay? I love it when people come up and, and talk to me after service and say, hey, you know what? You know, this also fits with what you were saying, or what do you think about this? And they have their own insight into God's Word, because that shows me that, that you guys are doing the work. Um, we are to study why, to show ourselves approved, that, that we don't need to be ashamed. Okay, so study should be an integral part of being a Christian. Okay, not just reading, although I encourage you, read. Don't, don't um, you know, just open the book and read. See what God has to say in His Word. Okay? And then study as well. Start breaking it out. Start looking for applications. Start looking for connections. Because you realize it's one love letter written from God to us. From Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22. It's one letter. Now, God used a bunch of different uh, scribes, if you will, to pen this letter. But it's an amazing thing to see all the ways that God weaves things in and out of His Word. So, Today, we are continuing with our Essentials of the Faith, and I'm not really sure how far we're going to get, but we are talking about the Trinity. Now, this is one of the core components of the Christian faith, and as a matter of fact, in my research, I found there are actually quite a few uh, Christians throughout church history that don't believe that this is a critical component. They believe it's a secondary component. That, yeah, you need to believe that, but don't let that cause you problems if you struggle with um, the, the whole idea of the Trinity. I'm going to let you know right now, you should struggle with the idea of Trinity because you've got a small brain. <laughs> you know, We've got small brains. We're trying to take something that works in a finite manner and trying to understand an infinite God. So, um, one of the, the men that I was studying uh, actually made a comment. He says, while the Trinity is something that can be apprehended, 
it is not something that can be comprehended. Okay? And when he said that, I thought, oh, that's really cool. What is he talking about? <laughs> that sounds really cool, but I, I don't know what he's saying. So I went and I looked up the difference between apprehended and comprehended. And apprehended is to lay hold of something. Both of them carry the idea of understanding. But apprehended means that you, you just kind of grasp it. You don't really get the whole thing, but you're, you're there. You, you, you're starting to. Okay? Apprehended is to grab hold of it. All right? Comprehend is to fully understand it. Now, if anyone in here comprehends the Trinity, I'm just going to let you know right now, honestly, you're deceived. Okay? You've apprehended it, but you don't comprehend it because it's infinite. It's one of the great mysteries of God. That's what makes Him God and us not. Okay? So if you would go ahead and put that, that up. I've got a little diagram that I want to show you. Um, in essence, the best definition that I could see for Trinity is that God is one in essence and three in person. Or you, what you can say is one substance and three subsistences. Okay? Now, what that means is that in essence, in what makes up God, what makes God who He is, He is one. Okay? Now, we're going to start diving into Scripture here in a minute, but I want to get this idea out so we all understand what we're talking about. So there's no misunderstanding about what Trinity is. When I say Trinity or Triune, I want everybody to be on the same page. All right? So if you look up at the diagram, you see in the middle, God. God is one. Okay? But the three persons, now the essence is just what he's made up of. The persons, now that's not person like me and you. Because uh, as an integrated person, I'm body, soul, and spirit, and, and I'm my own person. You, your own person, and none of you is me, and I'm not you. But when we're talking about the person of God, this is where we have to set aside human understanding. Because one of the greatest flaws that I've seen in people trying to comprehend, to apprehend Trinity and Trinity doctrine and theology is that we want to take our place, our position, and apply it to God. You can't. Because he's not like us. He's different, okay? He is holy, he's completely separate. Yeah, he's made us holy, but he hasn't made us God, okay? That, that's another thing that's kind of woven itself in and out of the church uh, throughout history. It flew, flared up again back in the 90s. Um, not only does God, you know, make us holy, he does not make us God. We will never become God, okay? Little g, big g, doesn't matter. We're not going to become gods. There's one God. There's none before him, there's none after him, so and there's none with him. So at no time are we ever in a place to be God. So let's just settle that right up front. We don't become gods. But if we look at the person of God, we see three different unique persons. Now when I say person, the way we define this is when God the Father speaks of himself, he says, I. But when he speaks of the Son, he says, you, or him. And when he speaks of the Holy Spirit, he says, you, or him. He defines it as other than himself. Okay? Now keep in mind, the same God in uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. Is that right, 6.4? Uh, I always reverse it. 6.4 is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Okay, so it's one God. God has said there is only one God, but he refers to different components. All right, so we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So our definition is that there is one God in three persons, co-equal, co-eternal. Okay, do you get that? One God, three persons, co-equal, they're all the same, co-eternal. They've always been the same. Okay? Now, um, we're going to kind of work through, and, and I'm not really sure, I'm, I'm still even now struggling whether I want to get into a certain component of this this week or next week. I'm thinking, actually, we're going to talk about the deity of Christ just a little bit this week, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit more next week. Um, but I want to start in the Old Testament. 
Well, because that's where the book starts. That's where the history starts. So we're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to start looking at the idea of Trinity throughout the Old Testament. Now, one more thing on the diagram I want to bring your attention to. You'll notice that it has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It has all of them are God. But do you notice on the outside, it says, is not, this is part of what we talk about when we talk about the subsistence or the person of God, because the Son is never referred to as the Father. The Father is never referred to as the Spirit, and the Spirit is never referred to as the Son. So they are uniquely individual in, in person, but making, combining one essence. All right? So, here we go. This is one of these uh, brain benders. Now, for those of you, I'm going to give you a lot of information today. All right? There's no other way to do it because the idea of Trinity starts in Genesis 1 and it runs all the way through Scripture. There's a lot of material to cover. I'm not going to get to all of it. Uh, there are a number of books that you can read. Uh, Jeannie uh, give, gave me a book. Um, oh, it's not up there anymore. Uh, Jesus in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's an incredible um, teaching on Jesus in the Old Testament. And it's, it's done by a Jew, a, a Christian Jew. But it's done by a Jew from the perspective of a Jew. And trying to explain to the Jews how this Christ in the New Testament is not just something new, but that he's woven all throughout the Old Testament scriptures. So that's a fantastic place. There's, there's other material. Um, I have, I've read about oh, uh, components from probably eight books, uh, probably 12 to 15 different websites. There's a lot of information out there. Be very careful what you read. Okay? Because there's a lot of people that want to start bringing in things in order to comprehend the Trinity, and they end up with some teachings that will really trip you up. Okay? Try the <coughs> modality, uh, just uh, Arianism. There, there's a bunch of different things that will really trip you up. So be very careful, because it's in essence, if it says anything outside of what we said, one God, eternally existent, co-equal, in three persons. If it says anything beyond that, you got to be careful, all right? So, let's get into this. Uh, by the way, when we're done with this, after I've wrapped this part of it up, I will get my notes back up. I'll make it available to whoever wants it because I'm not even going to touch a lot of what's in my notes, all right? So, Deuteronomy 6.4. We talked about this last week. Remember, we talked about monotheism, one God. Deuteronomy 6.4, this is called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, monotheistic outlook reads that, that see there is only one God. We talked last week about poly polytheism and atheism and deism and all the different things that break out to that. And, and uh, as Christians, we are monotheistic. We believe there is one God. Um, but what's interesting here is the Jews, this is kind of the centerpiece of their faith. Okay? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And... <coughs> This is one of the, the scriptures that they use that causes them a stumbling block to Christianity. Because Christianity says, yes, God, there is God the Father, but there is also God the Son. Well, no, because there's only one God. Okay? Um, what's interesting is last week we talked about the word for one that is used there. Does anybody remember what it is? What's that? Ka. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you a couple different verses. Don't worry about looking them up because I'm going to hit them pretty quick. Uh, if you need them afterwards, come see me and I'll get them to you. Uh, Genesis 1.5, it says, uh, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, the first day in Hebrew is Yom Echad. Okay? And that word means one day. All right? So we're going to just remember this. We're going to hit a couple more. Um, 
Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Basar Acha. One flesh. Alright? Ezra 3.1 When the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Ishakad. Okay? One man. Now, the, the interesting component about all of these is Akkad doesn't mean one in the idea that we have as one. If uh, I pick up, oh look, here's a guitar pick. There is one guitar pick. That, that's not what Akkad means. Okay? Akkad is a joining together that unifies. Now, there are other words in the Hebrew that mean just one, just like one guitar pick. Akkad is not one. Okay? Akkad is a joining together to make one. Now, what's interesting is this is a problem for, for Jews. Because why would God use this word saying that I am one, but the word that he uses for one means a joining together? And, and several of the ideas that they've come up with, and, and we'll see this in, in um, Genesis. Uh, actually, flip over to Genesis 1, because we're going to touch on this real quick. Because the same concept comes up here. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 26. Genesis 126 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, I, I, I know a lot of times I can be odd when I read, but I'm always asking questions when I read. And the, the first thing that jumped out to me right here is, let us. Who is us? I mean, who is God talking to? Now, according to Hebrew teaching, there's three potential answers to this. Um, the first one is that God is speaking to the earth because it's from the earth that he's going to make man. It's not widely accepted. As a matter of fact, in most parts they go, no, because... Man had not been created, and the earth was not part of the creation. It was the material from which God drew me. So God isn't speaking to the earth as though he were speaking to a person. So most Jews look at that and go, yeah, no, that, that's not it. The second one that, that has a little bit more following, but still not a lot of following, is that God is speaking to man himself. Okay, let us make man in our image. Again, man wasn't created. So, you know, who's he talking to? Uh, he hasn't started molding the mud. So, uh, you know, that, that really logically doesn't follow through. And the third one, and this is the one that is most often held by, by Hebrew scholars, is that God is speaking to the angels. <coughs> I have a problem with this. <coughs> the problem is that nowhere in Scripture do we ever see the angels being involved in creation. Nowhere. Anytime creation is referred to, it's referred to in the Old Testament as God made, God created. Okay? Uh, actually, we're going to touch on a little bit of that in a minute because there are also places where I am convinced that it says Jesus made. Okay? It doesn't use the word Jesus, but it, it says, you know, we'll get there. Alright? So, I, I really struggle with this interpretation, but they have to have something because for God to be speaking to someone, who else is there? I think God is speaking to the other two components. Back up. Let's back up a little bit earlier in Genesis 1. Because we're going to see something here real quick. Um, I had the men in discipleship start doing it, and this was one of the first scriptures I asked them to research the Trinity, and this was one of the first ones they got. Um, Genesis 1, I'm going to start in verse 1, says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
You see that? Okay? We see already two components, two persons of the Trinity in the first two verses of Scripture. We see God that is creating. We see the Spirit that is hovering. Okay? So when we get down to verse 26, and God says, let us, doesn't it seem more logical that God is speaking to at least His Spirit? Doesn't that seem to follow through? Now, again, don't get me wrong. The Jews are holding tightly to what they believe God has shown them. I wish sometimes that we would hold this tightly to what God has shown us. Because they are stuck on, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. <coughs> With the misunderstanding of Ichab. So, we see... Let us make man in our image, Genesis chapter 1. We already see that there's a plurality here. Now, let me, let me clarify something for you. When I say plurality, I'm not speaking many gods. I'm speaking many persons. As a matter of fact, three persons. Okay? So when I'm saying plurality, I always am referring to the Trinity. Because I don't want anyone walking away from here going, wow, Pastor just taught us that there's three gods. No, that's not what we're saying. As a matter of fact, we're saying that's not the case. There is one God. Okay? So, um, I'll skip that part. We'll touch on that later. So, there are three components. So, well, actually, we see that there are multiple components because we see Ichad. We see the usage that would indicate a unity out of several. But how many are there? Did you know that the Old Testament really very clearly indicates to us how many components there are to God, how many persons there are? That the Trinity is not a New Testament idea, but that it's settled and quickly established in the Old Testament? Did you know that? Now, I, I want to share something with you because if you talk to certain cults, what they're going to tell you is, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. Neither is the word monotheism. <laughs> so next time you talk to Jehovah's Witness and they tell you that, be sure to respond, neither is the word monotheism. Okay? The reason that we believe a Trinitarian doctrine is because of systematic study. Now what that means is the first rule of herm hermeneutics, of Bible study, is that all scripture should be interpreted in light of all scripture. Okay? So when you're reading a passage of the Bible, you don't just take that passage and run with it. You always look at it in light of what the whole Bible says. Okay? For example, um, in uh, one of the epistles, it talks about baptism of the dead. Baptizing the dead. Uh, there are cults that take that passage and they baptize the dead. That's, read it in context. Read the passage in context. What Paul is saying is, don't! He's saying, no! This is not a good thing. Okay? So, when we come to the conclusion that there is a triune God, it's not because we look through Scripture and say, up, triune, up, triune, trinity, three in one. That's not how we arrived at this. Well, how we arrived at this is through a systematic study starting in Genesis and looking at all of the passages that refer to God and to see how they connect. Okay? When you do that, when you can do that with intellectual honesty, you'll see that there can be no other answer because God says that He is more than one, but one. So we see plurality. We see that there is not just one component that makes up God. But then we go further and we say, well, how many are there? Well, that's where we're going to jump right next. Because, um, oh, wait a minute. I jumped ahead. I jumped ahead. We've already seen two components of God, right? Genesis 1, we see God that made, and we see the Spirit hovering. All right? But, but there's a, how many of you noticed an apparent contradiction in the Old Testament? 
Um, there are a number of passages. I'm going to read just a couple of these real quick. Uh, Exodus 33.20 says, uh, But he, being God, said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Hmm. John 1.18 says, No one has seen at any time, seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is the bosom of the Father, he is explaining. Um, John 5.37, And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You see, any of you ever notice there are a number of passages that said you can't see God. No one can see him and live. Well, there's a whole other series of passages that appear to contradict that. Because Genesis 17.1 says, Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Okay, now, the way that a lot of people take this is, oh, Abram had a vision. That's not what it says. It doesn't say he was sleeping. It doesn't say he dreamed this. It doesn't say he had a vision. Matter of fact, when those occasions happen, they're very clear. While I was by the river, I had a vision. Okay, while I was dreaming, it came to me. Okay? Those are very clear. Um, Genesis 18.1, Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. Exodus 6, 2, 3, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appeared to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Lord, I did not uh, make myself known to them. Now that one right there gives us a clear indication of, of the problem. Because there's two words that are being used here to define God. The first is the Lord. If you look in your Bible, you'll see the word Lord is capitalized. Most of the, the English Bibles do this. When you see Lord capitalized, the reason it's capitalized is because that is the word Yahweh. Okay? That is God's personal name that he identified himself to, Mo, uh, to uh, Moses as. Okay? It, it means I am. I am eternally existent. I am that I am. I exist because I am. Okay, but then he, he goes down a little bit further. You see what he says? He says, uh, I am God Almighty. I mean, did you know that's a different word? That's a different name for God. Did you know that? That one is El Shaddai. Did you know that? Now, the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this is because a lot of times in English, we don't read with insight the way that a Jew would. Why? Because they're taught how to read. Okay? We're taught nouns, verbs, adverbs, proper order. Um, you know, we're, we're taught all these rules, half of which I don't even know. I've forgotten. But, but we just kind of read linearly. Okay? When the Jews are taught to read, they're always taught to watch for things. Repetition. They're, they're taught to look for distinctions. They're taught to watch for these things. So we have God here very clearly identifying himself in two ways. I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh. I am that I am. Okay? But we also have him declaring himself to be El Shaddai, God Almighty. Why do you think this is happening? Well, let's read a little bit further and then we'll come back to this. Um, Exodus 24 9 uh, says Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles and the sons of Israel. And they saw God, and they ate and drank. That just seems odd to me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how much appetite I would have if God were to appear to me standing on pavement of sapphire. <laughs> oh, makes me long for a ho-ho. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, they, but that's what they do. So God appears again. Now there's a number of passages, I won't hit all of them. But what we see is what a lot of people who want to oppose Scripture say is a contradiction. They say, well, how on the one hand can he say, nobody can see me and live, and on the other hand, show himself to people that live? Why do you suppose that is? 
Why do you suppose it is? Now, in the New Testament, Jesus made very clear, I actually read one of those a little bit earlier, uh, in John 5, 37, he says, And the Father who sent me, he has testified to me, you have neither heard his voice, nor at any time seen his form. Hmm. John 6, 46, he says, Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from the Father. He has seen the Father. 1 Timothy 6 says, He who is blessed is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. How do we reconcile this contradiction? Because if this is one love letter written from Genesis to Revelation by one God with one thought, with one flow, how do we defend against the accusation that this is a contradiction? Well, we go back to the idea that there is a plurality in the essence of God. One essence, three persons. Now, I keep saying three persons, and I'll show you in a minute where we get three persons, okay? So, let's, let's touch on that real quick. Isaiah 48. Flip over there if you would. Isaiah chapter 48. Um, would you go ahead and put that up? I guess you don't have to flip there because it's up. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 48, verses 12 through 16. He says, Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I call. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall perform his purposes on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken and called him. I have brought him, and he will prosper in his way. Draw near to me. Hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to me, I have been there. And now, the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Now, I'm, I, I made this easy for you. Would you flip to the next one, please? I, I highlighted certain things that I want to draw your attention to. Um, the first, I'm going to go to the red. It says the Lord and the Lord God. Okay, this is obviously, this is speaking of the monotheism, the God that we worship, right? The Lord. When, when you see the Lord God, that's what we're looking for. But, but we have two other things that are going on here, one of which is obvious, because he says, um, and now the Lord God has sent thee and his spirit. Well, wait a minute. God sent this person and his spirit. Now, in the Hebrew, just so you know, because in, in, I don't like this translation as well, but because those are the Bibles that we have in here, that's the one I used. Really, what the, we've juxtaposition, we need to reverse those. It says, the Lord has sent, the Lord has sent me and his spirit. The Lord... God and His Spirit has sent me. Okay? Or you could even actually reposition that a little bit in the Hebrew to say, the Lord God has sent me and His Spirit. Either way, there's three components that are being addressed. Alright? So, we have the Lord God, we have the Spirit, but you see me, I highlighted that. You know why I highlighted that? Because let's look at this in context again. Who's me? Let's back up to the front, and it says, listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I call, I am he. I am the first and I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. See, the me that is talking there is the one that created. <gasps> oh my. So, we see from here, because of the way, now remember we talked about person, and the definition of person God refers to himself as I, or me, but he refers to the Son and the Holy Spirit by name. Jesus refers to himself as I, or me, refers to God and the Holy Spirit by name. The Father and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the same thing. So, following that, what do we see here? We see 
the Lord God being addressed by name, even though the speaker says he created, we see the Spirit being addressed by name, and we see me, not me, 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 that person me. The me that is speaking there, who claims credit for having created. Now, this passage right here should cause all kinds of conflict for a good Jew. Because only the Lord has created. Only God has created. So who is this me? Well, obviously, it's God, right? So we see right here in this passage three components making up the essence of God. Let's go to the next passage real quick. We're not going to get very far. <laughs> okay, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn and die, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Let's, let's go to the next one. I color-coded this one, too. Um, I use the same colors. Isn't that cool? Um, the Spirit of the Lord... God is on me. Oops. The Spirit of the Lord God. Okay, there it is, the Holy Spirit. You got it? Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Now, what's interesting, the me, I, I just put one me up there in the green, so we have God the Father, God the Spirit, and me again. <clears throat> me again. But look at what me is doing. Me is doing only what God can do. Bringing healing to everyone. Setting all of the captives free. Look at that. Do you guys see the Trinity being laid out here? Now, interestingly enough, we had uh, for those of you that weren't at men's group Thursday, you missed a really cool men's group. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was uh, the reading of the Torah in the synagogue. And um, I, I was unaware of this. But did you know that the, the reading of the Torah the, and the prophets is very carefully scheduled? Did you know that? They have a schedule that they go by. And do uh, you guys remember when we see this passage again in the New Testament? <coughs> remember that? At the outset of Jesus' ministry, he goes into the synagogue, as was his wont, and he was chosen to speak. And this was a passage that was scheduled to speak. Ooh, ooh, wow. Do you see God's sovereign hand in that? Because what happens? Jesus reads this passage, and then he closes it up, and he hands it back to the attendant, and he says, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. Hey guys, this is me. <gasps> oh my. Um, it's no wonder that certain times they wanted to kill him. Because what he is saying, and they understood this, is he's declaring that he is God. That's why they're today. They all right, you know what? Hey, we got a really neat clip right over here. Let's take him and throw him off. You get that? Because see, we read that and we go, huh? Oh, he just read the scriptures. And he says, I'm here. I mean, if this was just a prophet or just an anointed one of God that is coming to do this, okay, yeah, prove it. Put your money where your mouth is. Don't pick him up and throw him off the cliff. Prove it. So what we see here is a second very clear laying out of a triune God. <gasps> I'm going to address one more thing. All right? One of the things that people will come against you with, and they will say that God cannot be one and three. It's a contradiction. Now, I, I don't spend a lot of time in philosophy. It makes my head hurt. Um, I, I don't really get into how can you prove that you exist. Well, I can prove I can exist because I can dot your eye. That'll convince you. Um, I, I'm not really into that. But one of the three laws of philosophy, of classical philosophy, is called the law of non-contradiction. Okay? 
And very simply, the law of non-contradiction says this. You cannot claim something is and is not. Okay? So you can't claim something to be and not to be at the same time. Okay? Uh, for example, um, the law of non-contradiction, we would hold that up to uh, Charles Dickens' uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Now that would be an apparent contradiction, right? How can it be the best and the worst? Well, the, the thing is, he's not saying that the same things that were the best were the same things that were the worst, okay? He's saying that there were parts of it that were the best and there were parts of it that were the worst, okay? So that's not a contradiction. Now, if I were to say that I were one essence comprised of three different persons, that would be a contradiction, okay? Despite how many voices I hear in my head, I'm still one person, right? So if I were to say that I am one, but I am three, that would, be, that would violate the, the, the rule, the law of non-contradiction. Now here's where we need to be clear. God is not us, okay? So when people want to go, oh, that can't happen because it's a contradiction, for you it would be a contradiction. For me it would be a contradiction. Yes, I agree. But God is not us. God is separate. God is unique. There is nothing else like him in all of creation. Or you know what? Even outside of creation because God existed before creation. Okay? So when people come at you and they go, well, that's a contradiction. He can't be one and three. You know, oh, you know, the, the Jehovah's Witness like to go, oh, the three-faced God. Gosh, we're so intelligent. If life consisted of only the things that I understood, you guys would be in a lot of trouble. Because there's a lot of you that wouldn't exist. And I probably wouldn't exist because I do things all the time that I don't understand. Okay? So... Just to, to, to satisfy, just to prepare you, when somebody comes and says, you know, you know, that's a contradiction, it's not a contradiction. It's not. Because if it were to go against God's nature, well, yeah, then it would be a contradiction. It goes against my nature, I can't be one in three. Okay? Now, I, I know some of you are thinking, well, what about body, soul, and spirit? Yeah, I, I don't call my body, soul, and spirit by different names. Okay? You know, this is... This is Glenn the body and Bob the spirit and Fred the soul. We don't do that. Okay? So that's a poor example. All right. But God the, the unified being does that. And it is not against his nature. As a matter of fact, this is where one of those things where um, ultimately God put it in his word so that we would be able to apprehend him. But he didn't put in us what was necessary to comprehend him. And that's okay. Because again, we go back to Hebrews. God doesn't want our understanding. We don't have to figure him out. Right? What do we have to do? Have faith. Have faith. we got to trust him. Okay? So, one thing I just want to address real quick and, and we'll wrap up. Why is this important? Why does this matter? Why can't we just let well enough alone and just go on and be happy? Why do we have to trouble our little brains with stuff like this? Because God put it in there. Okay? I'll show you why. Uh, there's a couple of different things. One, uh, the idea of monotheism without a trinity leads us to a lot of problems. And, and one of them I, I will share with you is critical. Redemption. Because, see, if God is perfect in justice, and according to the perfection of his justice, we deserve death, and we can do nothing to get out of that debt, God would violate his very nature by sacrificing himself. He couldn't sacrifice himself. That would be a violation of who he is. And that's, a, that's another one of those philosophical things that I read and I go, huh, Hey, babe, what's for dinner? <laughs> and how soon? It's just like those guys that solve the car. Eat and drink when you're done. That's right. So, if 
we have this understanding. Why is it important? If, if God is one, and there is no aspect to him that can show us mercy, how then do we receive redemption? We go, oh, well, how does that work with God being separate? Well, remember, when was the, slab, the lamb slain? From the foundation of the world. And, and that actually means, you know, before creation, it was decided that he would die. Okay? So when God, the unified essence of God, determined to create creation, there's another one for you. Did you ever get that? We, we see that God created by the power of his hand, by the power of his word, God created the word. What does John call Jesus in John chapter 1? The word. When God created, it was almost as if God used his right hand and his left hand, the word and his spirit. Because in Genesis 1, we just saw that his spirit was involved. How, do, how does that happen without Trinity? Without a tribe God? So, um, wh why is it important? Because God says it's important. Okay? Um, very clearly, black and white and red and white, depending on your Bible and the New Testament, Jesus makes it very clear. Um, we're going to talk a little bit next week about all three of them being God because God the Father says very clearly, I am God. God the Son says very clearly, I am God. And God the Spirit says very clearly, I am God. Okay? So what we've established today is the principle of a plurality in the Godhead. We've established that there, that there has to be a trinity. Scripture lays that out clearly. Next week we're going to fill in the blanks and show you who is that trinity throughout Scripture. Okay? Remember next week also um, is uh, Resurrection Sunday. So actually I'm probably going to push that to the following week. Next week we're actually going to touch on a little bit different aspect of the trinity. You'll have to talk. So, um, keep with me, folks. I, I know there's a lot of information. Um, I got seven pages here, and we got a page and a half. Okay? Um, I haven't even touched most of the scriptures yet. So, uh, let's pray. Father,